My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides. Making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy, while still maintaining respect for the art. Which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Hello, my friends and listeners. This is Aaron Odom coming to you again for another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. Man, what a journey we've taken here. I'm really, really excited that we've been able to do this for so long. We're coming up on a year. Ah! I'm really excited about this. But today I've got a great guest and this 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 podcast has given me the opportunity to reconnect with so many old friends from my past. And just today, I've reconnected with a friend. We haven't actually seen each other's moving faces, as she said, when we first started streaming together. We haven't seen each other in probably 10 to 15 years. But from Seattle, my good old actor buddy who was in my first show with me in Seattle, I have Christine Shaw. Hello, Christine. Hello. Oh my gosh, that was your first show? That was my theatrical premiere. <laughs> okay, that's how it's going to be. I got it. <laughs> Take your notes, man. I got my actor notes all here. Yep. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, God, it's so good to see you again and good to talk to you again. Um, now, before we got on here, you were telling me that um, you just finished directing a project a few months ago. So what was going on there? Yeah, well, I haven't actually directed. I directed a 10 minute play in the last 30 years since I had my directing class in college for my theater. <laughs> and I didn't, I, I'm so tired as a six foot tall middle aged girl with a gimp vocal cord <laughs> waiting to sit around for people to cast me. And I, really loved the play. I love the play No Exit since I left college. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And well, I'm not going to tell you some of the logistics about it because uh, we did a few little no-no things, but <gasps> even at that. I uh, didn't hear a thing. No, you didn't. But we did a little staging. Uh, one of my boyfriends built me a stage in my backyard because he's a union carpenter. And we just did a little two night reading uh, extravaganza. Oh. A, 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 a highly, highly stylized and choreographed and semi blocked reading of it. Oh. And it was hilarious. See, this is the thing about No Exit. I am so tired of earnest productions of No Exit. <laughs> <laughs> no Exit is a fucking comedy. It's hilarious. So is. It so is. Yes. I, yeah. I love I love when people get like absurdist pieces or symbolist pieces like that, and they don't see that the playwright was like, no, this is funny. It's hilarious. So it was, and, and I just had such a good time. Interact. The actors were brilliant. Um, I, I just had a good time and I wanted it to be outside because we did, we wanted to be COVID aware. Mm -hmm. We wanted to give the option. And so, and it was also just my first four way foray. There we go <laughs> back into kind of theater after COVID because mm -hmm. I was doing yeah. a show when COVID hit that got the whole last two weeks got canceled. Oh. So yep. yeah, we, I was just like, you know, and you sit there tapping your, your wrist when you're like, I got to do more, when I got to do more. 
that's something we've talked about a lot on this podcast. Like if you go back and listen to my episode three, my guest for that was saying that this, the idea that a Renaissance always follows the plague. So, <laughs> it, yeah. And, and so we are looking at new ways to do this. I mean, when the pandemic hit and a few months in, everybody was going, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. And I go, hey, y'all, this is a major global event. In my opinion, there's not a normal to go back to. It's and never going to happen. Yeah. No, no. I just did a show this last weekend where I gave a speech on the state of theater during the majority of the COVID pandemic. And yeah. I said, it really gave us the opportunity to address some things that at the pace we were going, maybe we couldn't address like yeah. body image issues and casting and the ethical and fair treatment of on stage and off, off stage and off screen actors and technicians and stuff. Uh, I, and, and, but then it's also giving us the opportunity to reevaluate the delivery of this product. You know, the fact that you're like, how about we just do like what Homer fucking did and tell some stories around a fire yeah, exactly. that have been essential to our culture. I think that's amazing. I, real quick. I, I think the storytelling aspect to answer what I hear a lot of theater people saying right now is, you know, what do I do? How do I blah, blah, blah. And I think that you just stated that. Lean into the story. Yeah. Whatever yeah. your paradigm within theater, lean into the story. Because, I mean, frankly, that's that that's it. I mean, we're telling stories. Regardless of all the glitz and glamour and the spangles and the amazing lights and fog, at the end of the day, it's a story that you're listening to. Unless you're going to a Cirque show, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the, mus the pretty muscles move through the air. That's Ooh. what I'm Cirque mm -hmm. shows. Mm -hmm. Now, we were talking just a little bit about how theater has affected the Seattle community. And I haven't been up there. I left there in 2008. Uh, and that was right before another huge, uh, you know, the, the, the housing bubble burst. And, and that had a huge impact on the theater economy. Um, but now we've had this happen. And it sounds like people group together in areas of comfort. I loved your analogy about clans. Can you go over that again? <laughs> oh, no, no. It just, I kind of sometimes, and this is also because I'm a big fan of the show Outlander. Watch it. Has great, <laughs> great sex scenes. Anyway, that's what's <laughs> um, <laughs> I sometimes feel the Seattle theater community, we are. We have different clans that exist all around the city, you know? There's the 1448 clan. There's mm -hmm. the Seattle rep and in Intamon and Fifth Avenue. You know, the yeah, there's the fringe people like me who've just been, you know, doing side fringe projects for 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's all these different, and in normal times, they do what clans do. Sometimes they get together and have brunch. Sometimes they get together on a battlefield and cut each other's heads off. <laughs> it, you know, it just depends. But but and we're all doing the same thing. So there's that analogy. And then what happened, what I think that what I have experienced is COVID, first of all, made us all officially go right down to the very core nuclei of our clans, as it were. Right. Yeah. And and I think that after figuring out, you know, we had vaccinations and we had or we had masks, then we had vaccinations and we had all these things that like, okay, it's a little more safe, a little more safe. And I think some of that clanship, both literally and figuratively, you know, with the five person bubble rule and all that, I mm -hmm. think we're trying to figure out, are these clans what they were before COVID? Do oh. these clans fit together in the way they used to? Which clans do we really feel connected to? And which clans are are saying and doing and searching out the stories that I personally, as an actor, blah, blah, whatever in Seattle, am interested in telling. Right. And yeah. I just really affected that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. That's interesting. So so it's not so much like no new membership cards would be given out. They, oh. they are they are the, the waters are mixing, it seems. It is. They they are mixing. I mean, I'm seeing some of the same casting that you always see in Seattle. And oh, I don't yeah, yeah. necessarily think, I mean, I don't necessarily think that's a Seattle issue. I no, think no. Your Chicago actor, you have all the cities have their actors that they use. Yep. 
I think that COVID has done both. I think it has, it has brought some theater makers towards more stasis, whether the story, the uh, directing, the acting, the casting, whatever. And I think that it has spurned others and other clans to more innovation, more how do, we, ah. how do we tell our stories. So I do think it's a continuum. And I think that it shifts based on what the organizations are focusing on, in my experience. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Does that and, and that absolutely does. And, you know, uh, I mean, I... I started my professional career in LA and I, it took me about two months to realize, okay, I don't want to be an LA actor. And, and I went, okay, so what do I want to do? And I happened to visit Seattle at one point and I got to see a show and I'm like, shit, this is it. This is where, yeah, this is where I want to go for the next stage of my career. And, and it is, it's a very vibrant arts city and allows so many different opportunities to explore different realms of of how we do this art it's not all just huge crowd pleasing musical theater or it's not all heavy uh, minded uh plays from uh new playwrights it's it's all it's all there that's so awesome well i'm glad to hear that that's that's still going on <laughs> well um I'm going to go ahead and get ready and get into the episode today. Um, and I, I gave you something of a hint in saying that it does actually involve the Seattle theater scene somewhat. I'm so curious. I usually start these with a question. And now that I have uh, primed the pump and said it's about Seattle theater, I don't know if you're going to get right where I'm going. But the question I'm going to ask you, Christine, is what do you know about Star Whackers? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, you know what? Oh my God, there's so many answers to that question and probably none of them are correct. We'll be <laughs> right there. First of all, I date too many geeks. So it just reminds me of like a video game because you know, and I could be totally wrong about this. It seems like this might've been a show at some point that did mm. very badly. There mm. was something, I don't know, there was like something in the, late 80s or right before I got here where it was a musical about, oh my God, menopause brain. <laughs> menopause pop brain. I mean, come on, let's be honest. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's uh, legal. Uh, it's legal in Washington. Yes, it is. Uh, okay. Okay, so no, probably nothing at all. All right. Well, I'm going to start with a very lengthy quote that is taken directly from an impromptu press conference. For the past 20 years, my wife Evie and I have been the victims of criminal activities perpetrated by a small network of individuals who are out to destroy us personally, professionally, and financially. Up until a year ago, Evie and I had never had any run in with the law whatsoever. We are not criminals, nor are we fugitives from justice, nor are we crazy. I'm sorry, uh, let me shut my mouth. My mouth's hanging open. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. We are simply artists and filmmakers who are being racketeered on. We believe there to be a malignant tumor of star whackers in Hollywood. How many people do you know personally who have died suddenly and mysteriously in the past five years? I have personally known eight actors, all of whom, pause for tears, oh. all of whom I have worked with and was close to. Heath Ledger, Chris Penn, and David Carradine among them. I believe these actors were whacked, and I believe that many others, such as Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, and Mel Gibson are being played at to get their money." End quote. Wow. Wow. Anything here? I mean, like I, Dude, I have... I mean, it sounds like classic conspiracy theory, like in how it's the the speeches, but mm -hmm. why have I never, I mean, why have I never heard of this other than just- Oh, oh I think you will hear when I say the next oh, couple of things here. Shit. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, carry on. Fascinating. In October, 2010, actor Randy Quaid delivered this statement after a hearing in which Quaid and his wife, Evie, were applying for citizenship status in Canada. When Quaid mentioned the actors who died, he paused and looked legitimately on the verge of tears before composing himself and reading the names of the deceased. The statement was made in the lobby of a Vancouver courthouse after the Quaid's hearing had concluded. The statement went on and mentioned at least two names in this referenced cabal of sinister conspirators. 
Quaid's former lawyer, Larry Braun, who Quaid stated was working some sort of real estate scam on him, and Randy's younger brother, Dennis Quaid, whose name was on the deed of the property involved with Randy's former lawyer. Once he gave this statement, Quaid stood quiet and stoic with a worried look on his face as he gazed out over the heads of the reporters. Quaid's new Canadian lawyer, who stood by his side through the reading of the statement, then answered questions regarding Quaid's statement. One such question was, do you understand how paranoid and delusional your client seems? The lawyer declined to comment. <laughs> oh my God, dude. I, I must have been so high. I missed all this. <laughs> what the hell, dude? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is the almost indelible impression that Randy Quaid has left on popular culture. What appears to be a self-proclaimed victim of a shadowy organization hell-bent on money and power that will resort to murder in order to achieve its goals. Well, that doesn't <laughs> sound familiar, politics. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Oh, my God. As far as I know, this is the Randy Quaid that people remember. Despite his film appearance in The Last Picture Show, he was in that. It was his first movie. Was he really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Nobody remembers his Golden Globe winning performance as Lyndon Johnson in the TV movie LBJ, his Oscar nominated role opposite Jack Nicholson in The Last Detail, <laughs> or even as beloved cousin Eddie in the vacation movies. Wow, dude. Not a one of those did I remember. Right? Like, Before like, Randy. My kids love Christmas vacation and here we are coming into the holiday season yeah. and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, they watch that with their mom's family quite a bit and they watch it with my family quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, cousin Eddie is just, Hey, the shitter's full. And it's <laughs> like, it's great. It's great. Now for the better part of the last two decades, it would seem that Randy Quaid has been determined either to completely undo his positive standing in global culture or to prove to the world that he is one of a number of victims of the Hollywood system. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. Right? Right? So where did everything run off the rails for Quaid? Uh, do, I, I want, do you know? Do you mm -hmm. have an Oh, oh. We're gonna we're gonna deep dive into this here, Christine, because it does involve Seattle theater. <laughs> I'm so curious. Oh my god, I'm so curious. Okay, this is great. Okay, well, to answer what happened to Randy, we have to look at the progression of his career first. Now, Quaid started his interest in the performing arts in his Texas high school drama club and chose to study theater in college. And partway through his academic career at the University of Houston, Quaid auditioned for a part in the Peter Bogdanovich film, The Last Picture Show, and earned the role. From there, Quaid appeared in several films throughout the 70s and 80s, solidifying his place as an actor that could consistently get cast and could handle a variety of roles, despite not exactly nailing down a specific actor type. Although, Quaid recalls the 70s as a glorious time to be an actor in film, quote, the inmates were running the asylum and you can make any kind of movie you wanted. <laughs> that is not incorrect. <laughs> that is, that's a good point. Yet, the six foot four Quaid found some difficulty landing leading man roles, which it seemed like he was seeking. His iconic turn as cousin Eddie in the vacation movies was something he was somewhat against as he never really saw himself as a character actor, but he's six foot four. He's not, he's, he's an okay looking guy. He's not a super handsome guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, he's kind of built to be a character actor. Yeah. However, when the vacation movies started to make considerable profits, but more importantly, solidifying their places in popular culture, particularly Christmas vacation, Quaid warmed to the idea of being a character actor. And as he described it, he was a best friend who's goofy, the sort of comic relief thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Yep. I see that. Yep. Totally. In 1990, Quaid scored his first million dollar acting gig opposite Bill Murray in the R-rated comedy Quick Change. From there, the 90s were just gravy for Quaid with highly memorable roles in the motion picture Independence Day uh, and a couple other things here that I'll talk about. It would seem that Quaid's star power had strongly found its niche, right? Yeah, yeah. So I have to take a step back here in the timeline and introduce you to the major supporting character in this story. <laughs> oh my God, here we go. In 1998, Quaid was cast in the film Bloodhounds of Broadway opposite Madonna. This is where Quaid met Evie Montalanes, an aspiring filmmaker who had been hired as a driver for the film. She had picked Randy up to drive him to set, 
and she lost her way there. <laughs> wow. Quaid recalls that she wore cowboy boots and he offered to take her to dinner that night. They ended up at a Chinese restaurant in New Jersey and Quaid proposed marriage to Evie that night, which she gleefully accepted. Oh my, okay. So that's where he jumped the shark? In the uh, maybe, but I've heard of that before. Maybe I'm just cynical after my divorce, man. You know, <laughs> I love that. Here's, okay, here we go. Okay. Here's a quote. Here's a quote from Evie on the rest of the night. Then we went home and brushed our teeth and fucked. Ah. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Randy added, when we brushed our teeth, it was like we'd been doing it all our lives. Ooh. There was there was a kinship. Oh. oh, Randy, stop it. My nipples are hard. Oh, God. <laughs> Carry on. It's the little things, right? It's yeah, what a romantic. <laughs> you brush your teeth like I do. Ah! <laughs> Wait, isn't that class? Isn't that that classic old pickup line? Nice toothbrush. <laughs> Let's fuck. <laughs> That's funny. Evie pined even more about the evening, suggesting that an alternative plan for the evening would have been to have an orgy with the film's co-stars, Madonna and Jennifer Grey, at the direct invitation of Madonna. Oh, shit. Oh, shit, if I know where this is headed. Oh, my God. Neither, Hang on. Neither Madonna nor Jennifer Grey have commented on the legitimacy of the claim put forth by Evie. Oh, bless their hearts. <laughs> wow. Okay. Randy and Evie Quaid were married on October 5th, 1989. Randy was 39. Evie was 25. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. A little, little bit of an age difference, but it's love. It's yeah. Love. Yeah. I don't know. I'm such a cynic. Randy kept working pretty consistently through the 90s, appearing in major motion pictures like the aforementioned Independence Day and the R-rated comedy Kingpin, both in 1996. Despite all this financial success, the Quaids declared bankruptcy in 2000. Wow. From what it sounded like, Evie was pretty infamous for enjoying the fruits of her husband's wealth. She would buy expensive clothing, furniture, jewelry, pieces of art, even specially bred German Holsteiner horses. Oh my God. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Wow. The Quaids had several pieces of property that they let fall into disrepair or disuse and would be known for racking up tremendous hotel bills in places that they just liked to stay. Oh my God. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be nice? I could just, <laughs> yeah, it'll be like, you know what? I just like to stay here. I'll be out in a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, just bill us. Now, the 2000s didn't seem to aid Randy's career too much, despite still having quite a few credits on his resume during this time. He just couldn't find too many projects to help get out of the financial hole he seemed to be in. He did have a couple comeback roles, though. He got uh, Emmy nominated for his role as Colonel Tom Parker in the Elvis miniseries opposite, what was it, uh, Jonathan Reese Myers as Elvis. Oh, my God, that makes, oh, my God, I'm sorry, I just spit up a bit in my mouth. Jonathan <laughs> Myers, oh, uh -huh. I want to punch him, but go on. <laughs> You're too pretty. Uh <laughs> Don't talk. But he also did have a pretty significant role in the 2005 film Brokeback Mountain. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I forgot about him. Yeah. And, and this is where he first met and became close friends with Heath Ledger. Ooh. Yeah. But even this production is marred in his history as he sued the filmmakers for low pay. Wouldn't you kind of maybe address that when you signed a contract or not? <laughs> oh, well, here's the thing. His claim is that he was convinced to do the role as it was marketed to him to be a smaller independent film rather than the commercial art house juggernaut oh. it turned out to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you lose, dude. Come on. Yeah. Basically, he thinks if he knew if he knew the filmmakers plan to make, make a much larger profit on it, then he should have gotten paid more. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That makes me feel like a lawyer, and that scares the fuck out of me. <laughs> so, yeah, I have no opinion on it. I should not have a good opinion. I'd be a horrible lawyer. Carry uh, on. Randy dropped the suit in 2006, claiming that both parties came to an agreement. Soon after, Focus Features, the production company responsible for Brokeback Mountain, released a statement that claimed that no agreement had actually been reached, but they were glad to have the matter behind them. Wow. So, we've got... That is interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Now, truth be told, and you know, you and I have both been actors and, and, and sometimes have been asked to do things that we might not have gotten any credit for or gotten the right pay for. I mean, truth be told, this could have been quite the significant case if that suit had ever gone into mediation or even trial, as many actors had expressed interest in equitable pay for films promoted as independent films. It was a huge market at that time. Yeah. But alas, Randy dropped the suit. <laughs> okay. So how does this all relate to theater in Seattle? I'm so waiting. Tell me. <laughs> well, it's via the character John Falstaff. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare's rogue military officer and classic drinking buddy, Falstaff has been one of the most celebrated comedic characters in the English language, mainly because he's a delightful scamp, and that's putting it nicely. Yes, yes. Here's a description of the character from No Sweat Shakespeare. Falstaff is dishonest and cowardly, boastful and narcissistic. At the same time, he is intelligent and insightful. He has a great command of language and repartee. All that makes for a great watchable character in a play. In The Merry Wives of Windsor, Falstaff is a different person, but he is, in all respects, the same fat, vulgar, disgusting old man. In other words, the same character. Now, while this quote mentions that Falstaff was in Shakespeare's Merry Wives, th that's actually the third play in which Shakespeare features him. Legend has it that he was so favored by Queen Elizabeth that she ordered Shakespeare to write another play that included him, which ended up being Merry Wives, even though there's no historical evidence to support that. Just hearsay. Wow, dude. Falstaff appeared prevalently in the play King Henry IV, Part I, as the drinking buddy to Prince Hal, and is central to Hal's understanding of the lower classes during his reign as king. And I would proffer that this character, Falstaff, is evidence towards my belief that Shakespeare did actually exist and knew both the upper and lower classes intimately. Interesting. Mm -hmm. If you'd like further discussion on that, please go back and listen to my episode number two of this podcast, The Authorship Question. I gotta say, it's making me, there's been a really long time between my theater history class and this. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like I'm in school and want to be taking notes. Yay! Well, anyway. no, 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 no. This is no. great. Now, back to the Merry Wives of Windsor, in which yeah. Falstaff happens upon the town of Windsor to seduce two women, but more than anything, make sure that he had air quotes, sponsors, while rolling through the town on his wandering journeys. Yeah. But by the end of the play, Falstaff is rarely instrumental to the plot, except toward the end, where he is exposed as the amateurist fraudster he is, despite his boasts. He is tricked into embarrassing himself publicly, and in the end, all of his pranksters get their good laugh, but invite Falstaff to accompany them to join in their wedding celebrations, as they've actually grown quite fond of him themselves. Oh. Huh. He's the drunk uncle. You're like, yeah. See, I, well, I, grew, I grew up Mormon. I did never had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Tell me, what are they like? <laughs> now, for decades, a musical adaptation of *The Merry Wives of Windsor* was in the works, with music by Jack Herrick of the Red Claim Ramblers, which is a folk music band from North Carolina, and a book by John L. Haber and Robert Horn. The musical would be titled *Lone Star Love* and would be set in Texas after the U.S. Civil War and would set the story against a backdrop of country and bluegrass music. Oh, hell no! <laughs> I would never go see it. I don't know if there's enough fucking weed in the world to make me go see that. I'm sorry. I don't know. Maybe that's just my opinion. <laughs> I've often had to tell people, like, I see the, the musicianship and the craft within musicals like Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis. They just, they're not my bag. Like, I'm just not, yeah. Uh, and see, okay, so they are my bag, kind of. More okay. In the like, late 80s or whatever. But dude, I'm sorry. I'm so bored. I gotta, I gotta cut in here. I'm so bored with Shakespeare. Oh, 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 oh. I know, right? That's right? awesome. I know, <laughs> fighting words. And there is so much, I will totally say, there is so much, I don't know where I just, I've actually never seen Mary Wives. I can't yep. believe I can say that. But that said, taking Shakespeare and musicals, I don't know. And with folk and, kind of, oh. I mean, and sometimes it works. West Side Story was great. But, totally. but yep. guess what? Sondheim had his fucking hand in that. Yeah. And, yep. and I love me. Don't say a bad word about Sondheim or I'll cut a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll cut a bitch for some. Okay. I mean, I could also reference Kiss Me Kate, but, you know, there we go. I played Kate. 
Oh, did you? Yes, that was my senior. That was my senior lead that I played. Oh. I played one of my favorite moments was standing on stage singing I Hate Men, throwing uh, pots at little frogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, anyway. Okay. Right, All right, so, so we got Lone Star Love, uh, you know, okay. with, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. The play took a bit of a run off Broadway at the John Houseman Theater during the 2004-2005 season featuring J.O. Sanders as fall staff and Beth Lavelle, most recently seen in The Prom on Broadway in 2019. And I saw her in that. She was so fantastic. Lone Star Love received pretty mixed reviews, but this cast was able to record the cast album. And to my knowledge, it is the only one in existence. It really does exist. Really? It does. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't found it yet, but it's out there somewhere. God. Now, treating the experience more like a workshop than anything else, the book and music team went back to the drawing board, making some significant changes to the script and updating the track listing with some different songs. And as in the off-Broadway version, they would feature Jack Herrick and the Red Clay Ramblers as the band in the orchestra pit and often on stage. They felt they still had something, but maybe they had hit the wrong market. New producer Bob Boyette felt they needed to stage a remodeled version in an out-of-town tryout at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle. This was circa what year? This was 2007. Okay. They again hired veteran Broadway director-choreographer Randy Skinner, who had just recently come off a successful run of Dames at Sea on Broadway, and he had actually uh, directed and choreographed the off-Broadway production. But who to get for the lead role of Colonel John Falstaff? Oh, my God. You guessed it. Randy Quaid. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God, dude. This would be his first appearance on Broadway. And despite some criticisms towards his film career in the early 2000s, Quaid still held a lot of respect for his acting talent. Plus, his name in advertising would be a big draw once the production would get to Broadway. And the opening date was scheduled for November 1st, 2007. Rehearsals began that summer. Oh my God, I have no idea. Where was I? I was working. You didn't know about this? I can't oh. believe that I didn't know about this. This is okay. insane. Okay, as we go through this, some things might might start to trigger okay. some of Okay, here. okay, okay. Now, from all initial appearances, the production was going quite well. The press was invited to some rehearsals in the group's rehearsal hall, and interviews showed the cast and Quaid very complimentary of the work done so far. The music was energetic and welcoming, and the comedy was definitely in there somewhere. Quaid was even quoted to say that he was thrilled to bring this version of Texas to Broadway, having his origins in Texas as well. He continued to say that it was the hardest work he'd ever done, most likely meaning physically taxing. Because, you know, a film actor, like, you know, you can take a cut, you take yeah. a 15 minute break, come back and film your 30 second scene again. Okay, yeah. we got to take a 45 minute break now. No, this is, he's dancing. He's got to go off and get quick changes and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, he's having a heart. He's, he's loving it. Like in the interview, you can see him like physically sweating because he just came off from doing a number. He did also state as fact that Queen Elizabeth had asked Shakespeare to write this play to create another adventure for her favorite scamp, even though, as I mentioned before, there is no evidence to support that claim. Oh, Randy. But nonetheless, the cast and crew seem to have struck oil. <laughs> She's a smelter, Captain. Load the derrick. Yeah. Um, on September 24th, 2007, Producers announced that the Broadway run, rescheduled to open on December 3rd, 2007, would not be happening at all. They also announced that any plans for the musical would be announced once they were made. Starting that night, an announcement was made in the Fifth Avenue Theater that Randy Quaid had fallen ill with a respiratory ailment, and Falstaff would be played by Quaid's understudy until the run ended on September 30th. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Who was his understudy? Oh, I, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. uh, no, I, but I think I think it was another out of town actor that they brought. Oh, in, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I should look that up, though. I can find that. I mean, I probably don't even know. Them, but I'm just <laughs> uh, Tony Lawson. Huh. Yeah. See, like I thought. OK, here we go. Back to the back to the story. Fifth Avenue artistic director David Armstrong made the announcement himself. In an interview given to the Seattle Times that was printed on October 3rd, 2007, Armstrong praised his staff for their work in making sure that all patrons who had purchased advance tickets would be offered a refund, even though very few took them. They're like, yeah, I'll just come see the show anyway. 
I don't care if Randy Quaid's in it or not. Look how nice we were, Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> and it was only a, a week of shows that they really had to worry about. Okay. He even mentioned that Randy Quaid had a physician call Armstrong every day for the rest of the run to confirm Quaid's respiratory inflammation. <laughs> uh, <dude. Wow. laughs> no, he's really sick. Okay. Obviously. Yeah. But on the final performance, which was a matinee, yeah. Armstrong took the stage and did something a little unusual and commented on the production before the play began. Here's his quote. I wanted to acknowledge the rest of the company who are a class act. They worked very hard under very, very difficult conditions. I explained that in most cases, pre-Broadway runs help the show's creators assess whether the book, music, or lyrics need work. What we really needed was a different star, not due to the lack of talent, but someone with a different personality and sense of professionalism. End quote. Oh, wow, dude. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Burn. Well, hey, call it like you see it, man. Yeah, right. I mean. It, well, it makes it, you curious, too, like exactly what specific behaviors that, like, I'm so curious. Oh, you want to know? Okay. Well, in fact, this was not the first time reports of unusual rehearsal or backstage activity had been reported by the Quades or from the Quades. When interviewed to hear their perspective, Evie Quaid stated that Randy was very upset that he could not deliver the final performances in Seattle and dismissed any reports of tension between the Quaids and the rest of the cast or crew. Oh, yeah. Bullshit. Evie also stated that the Quaids had contacted new investors to try to get the play running again, quote, so that all of Randy's hard work isn't thrown away. Hims needs, hims needs a shrink, dude. <laughs> now, okay. I want to I want to state state here that this might lead to a conversation later about the sanity of this human being. Okay. Because I think everybody puts him in that category and I have a different take on it. But you're not wrong. Well, uh, <laughs> but my two degrees are in theater and psychology. <laughs> <laughs> That hard work that Evie was referencing seemed to be something of a collaborative work between Randy and Evie. Throughout the production and afterward, Quaid claimed that producer Bob Boyette gave him creative control of the project, allowing his personal vision of the Falstaff character to be seen on stage. That doesn't sound like an actor to me. That sounds like a director. Yeah. Randy took this to mean that he had full control over his hair, makeup, and costume, his lines and lyrics, and whether or not he could change them at will, and could submit suggestions quite often, which sometimes included removal of other characters in the play entirely. N Hell no! I'm sorry. <laughs> Hell no! Dude, you know what? He might be fine, and he might ultimately not be crazy, but fuck off! Hell no! <laughs> Dude! Oh, carry on. Please change my mind. Evie would often attend rehearsals with a video camera to document whether or not the conditions of the contract were being upheld. According to Actors Equity, which so most of us know as the Professional Stage Actors Union, and hereafter I will just refer to it as Equity, no recording is to be done during rehearsal by any Equity member. Randy was a member, Evie was not. So she claimed she didn't need to be compliant with the Equity rules. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, lawyers. <laughs> Hashtag lawyers. Carry on. <laughs> now, let me go back to the hair and costume for just a moment. As we can imagine from the description of Falstaff earlier, Falstaff is supposed to be a fat, garish man, as Shakespeare wrote many lines to support that, even though he's an officer in the King's Army. Quaid's vision for Falstaff did not include any kind of suggestion towards weight, as Quaid has always been somewhat slender and tall and gangly. His version included hair color that he couldn't quite settle on until the show opened. It ranged from blue to magenta, but he eventually settled on a deep beet red. Dude, oh my God. Costume and lighting designers, I bet they were just like, I'm gonna kill that fucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been fun to deal with. I'm sorry, go on. In addition to the choice for hair color that couldn't be supported by anything in the script or source material, Quaid's Falstaff costume featured what can only be described as an enormous cod piece, which would bulge out from underneath his trousers in every scene. Honey, get behind every other man on the face of the earth. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> really? Yep. Is, I mean, no, honestly, like, I literally, I can't think of a brain that's like, I really want my, my cod piece 
to be huge. I mean, like, why would you even care? No, no, no. See, like I said, it was underneath his trousers. So it's kind of like, I think what he was imagining here was like a man who would stuff his pants with socks. So he just did it for the method of it all. Then, yeah, what- yeah, he, yeah, he's basically saying like this is this character. Like he's he's this he's this interested in pro- projecting this masculine image. <laughs> See, but you know what? Of course, that makes me think. You know, so you haven't actually thought about your penis being larger than it is right now before this very moment. I mean, like, is it such a new fun thing for you? Bless oh, you. Oh God! God. Carry on. Okay, I'm done. During rehearsal, Quaid would often point it out to his castmates, thinking it would draw a laugh. Frankly, it was about the size and shape of a foam football. God. Oh my God, it's just getting worse. I'm sorry. Oh my God, a football. Heavy delighted in recalling it. Quote, <laughs> it was a huge cock. It was fucking great. It looked like gay Vivian Westwood. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Wow. <laughs> and like I said, this is a collaborative thing. So she's designing all of this and saying, Randy, you got to put this in here. And he's going, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, no, it's not. You need to change your hair color. You're right, I do. Oh, oh. On October 27th, 2007, after the production had closed and the Broadway run had been canceled, the producers and all 25 members of the cast of Lone Star Love filed charges with Actors' Equity against Randy Quaid for his lack of professionalism, verbal and physical abuse, and inappropriate sexual commentary. Wow. Here's just a short list of some of the grievances which could be corroborated by several witnesses, which were the final straw in addition to everything else they had been subjected to during the rehearsal process. On one occasion during previews, Quaid slapped an actor about the sides and back of his head four times without the actor's consent. When warned by the stage manager not to do it again, Quaid smacked the actor again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that makes me growl. Uh, It should. One actor was threatened that if he ever made eye contact with Quaid on stage, he would be fired. Uh, 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 uh. No, no, I don't care who you are. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quaid would often ad lib lines during rehearsals and performances and would often be absent from note sessions and rehearsals. I never want to work with that. Okay. I, oh, here's, here's one I can't wait to see what you got. During one performance, Quaid went off script to describe one of the band members' instruments as her gynecological instrument. Yeah, no, you know what? That would have been, yeah, that would have been the last straw. I would have had almost come to blows with him after that. Yep. Fuck that. Fuck that. Yep, Here. absolutely. Oh, Evie would argue later in an interview with Vanity Fair, which is the primary source for this episode, they were accusing Randy of Falstaff's character traits. He's supposed to be a lascivious monster. That is, that. okay, back to lawyers. That is the stupidest fucking excuse <laughs> in the entire fucking world. <laughs> Dude, acting no. real life. You need uh-huh. to... Look up the de- definition of actor, sweetheart. Uh-huh. Oh, and also, uh, no, I don't agree that Falstaff is a lascivious monster. He's uh, he's a schemer. He's a grifter. But he's not. No, I disagree. Yeah, Hector Projector. Uh. Yeah, right. A hearing for these charges was scheduled for January 25th, 2008 in Los Angeles. But the list of grievances against the Quaids had grown somewhat since then. You see, between the filing of the charges in October and the hearing in January, Evie made hundreds of calls to the equity office in Los Angeles and sent countless emails to equity asking for documents pertaining to the case. She also wrote a bevy of other actors trying to gain some sort of favor and ask for support, as the Quaids believed that the union was meant to uphold actors' contracts, and in this specific case, they did not. What about all these others, actors? Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh my God, it's disgusting. Yep. Evie even visited the office and caused a little bit of a scene in the main reception area. Here's an account from two of the equity employees about what happened when Evie visited the equity office on January 23rd, two days before the hearing. Evie Quaid, who appeared to be videotaping the incident, allegedly demanded that the regional director of the equity office hand over the documents pertaining to the hearing that the director claimed were not in her possession. The director said in her deposition that she, quote, feared both Mr. and Mrs. Quaid would physically attack me. 
Subsequently, the union decided to hire security protection for the staff on January 25th, the day of Quaid's hearing. Wow. I mean, she what? went in just guns a blazing, mouth just shooting off everything that she could. Dude, that's just not safe in any way. I would not want to be involved in a production that sucks. Yep. Equity reportedly filed a restraining order against Evie Quaid once the hearing was over. <laughs> or no, right? No, I, I got my timeline wrong. They, were, they, they, they put out that restraining order after she left the office two days before the hearing. Before the hearing. Huh? Yeah. As for the hearing itself, it lasted six and a half hours, hearing testimony from both sides. Evie tried to gain entry to the hearing, but due to the security detail, she was denied entry. <laughs> Quote, on January 25th, Evie Quaid returned to the union's reception area, allegedly screaming insults and calling the regional director a Nazi bitch. Before security guards could restrain her, according to the complaint, Quaid allegedly assaulted Equity's 76-year-old receptionist, William Feaster, drawing blood as she kicked his shins. Security then removed her from the building. And that's end scene. Now you've touched somebody. Yep. But during the hearing... Mark Block, an attorney representing the Quaids, said that these charges couldn't even be brought up as Randy had already resigned from the union after the Broadway run of Lone Star Love was canceled. <gasps> what? <laughs> what? Yeah, he quit the union. So they don't have to do shit then because he's not. No. Making, that makes me want to punch walls. Wow, dude. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, and. Uh, Evie filed her own charges on January 28th with and against equity, claiming that when she was escorted from the building on the 25th, the guards broke one of her fingers. Oh, you know what? No. Mm -hmm. No further information about the result of this filing could be found. <laughs> <laughs> A decision from the hearing was finally announced on February 1st. The result of the hearing led to a momentous event in theater history. Actor Randy Quaid was fined $81,572, which would be two full weeks of pay for the remaining cast. However, the decision also stated that Randy Quaid would be banned for life from the union due to his unprofessional behavior. And this is the first time an actor has ever been banned from equity. For, in general or for life? For life. You're out. You know? I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. I like right now. I immediately, I want to say, you know, good, good for him. Cause I'm so just, that just all sounds like shitty behavior. Yeah. But I don't know wh whether or not somebody can be banned for life from, uh, <laughs> from a labor union. <laughs> from any place actually. Right. Um, yeah. Now, some actors have been fined heavily in the past for taking non-union contracts, but never have been banned before. But of course, due to the claim that Randy had already resigned from Equity, he was not subject to pay the fines. Oh my God. Equity claimed that since he was a member of the run for the production, the fine would still stand. And in all my research, I never found out if the fine was ever paid or if further legal action was pursued by Actors' Equity Association. <laughs> And I want to know if he ever did theater again, you know? Oh, God, no. No, he did not. Nope. Mm -mm. Not even, I mean, obviously not equity, but like, I wonder if he's in some hole in the ground in, you know, third, you know, country just doing dinner theater. I'm, I'm, I'm going to lead you down exactly where he is here, okay? Mm -hmm. This was only the beginning of the legal troubles, and from all outward appearances, truly bizarre behavior from the Quades in the following several years. And while they don't directly relate to Quaid's involvement in Lone Star Love, that chapter is closed. They are still very interesting stories. So I'll do my best to summarize. <laughs> wow. Oh my God, I love this. Oh since, since the early 2000s, Randy stopped receiving royalty checks for his prior performances. Rather than inquire where the checks might have gone, it seemed obvious to the Quaid's that conspiracy was at play. There was even a suggestion that a former associate of, Quaid, of the Quaids attempted to lease the strip of land that their primary home's mailbox was on so the conspirators could have access to Randy's checks. Okay, no, well, you bring up mail theft. I, yeah. I recently actually experienced that. Oh. With, no, well, but the funny part, it was a gut test. Uh, this will take like two seconds. It was a gut test that basically... Um, you have to collect a sample 
of your mm -hmm. stool. Oh, <laughs> and okay. I, I sent my first one in, they couldn't use it. So I got the second one, they sent me another thing. I, uh, I went to go send it the morning that I, I completed it. Or I mean, I went, uh, I went to go put it in the mailbox the night that I completed it. And in the morning, my roommate was like, did you take your sample out of the mailbox? <gasps> I'm like, no. And somebody totally, somebody was out there mainlining my feces. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying, Isn't that funny? Well, okay. And I'm sure it was like in, in a, a, like a non-see-through container. It's like, no, it was in a little vial in like an envelope in another envelope. Okay. So you couldn't see what was in there. No, not at all. Oh my God. Can you imagine that guy getting back home and being like, ha, 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 this is going to be some prescription yeah, drugs and shit. But, but then I have a company and be like, okay, so you're never going to believe this, but I need to. <laughs> I got to go shit in a jar again. Uh, <laughs> I know. Carry on. Okay. The Quades were basically nomads and would frequently check into hotels for extended periods, as we discussed before. Yeah. However, they never seemed to want to pay the bills and several warrants were put out for their arrest for prior debts. One such bill for one stay was over $55,000. Oh, dude. The Quades were arrested in September 2010 for squatting in a home in Montecito, California, which they had sold in the past, but claimed that the sale was fraudulent and that the new homeowner doesn't exist when in fact she did. Evie was also charged with resisting arrest on this occasion, but she claims they, quote, hogtied her. I'm so mean. I'm like, well, if the shoe fits. <laughs> but, <laughs> but wow. And to bring it full circle to the refugee hearing that started this episode, the Quades <laughs> fled to Vancouver, claiming that they were refugees from a tyrannical system trying to embezzle all their money and assets and potentially kill them. Well, Evie's father was Canadian, so she could be granted citizenship. Randy tried to establish permanent resident status, but his application was denied. I mean, that's a little cathartic after all the things you told me about him. Wow, dude, I had no idea. The Quades eventually moved to Montreal, but illegally crossed the border to Vermont, where they were basically, they're not able to leave the state. The Quades say that this is all right with them, as Evie was raised in Vermont, and they plan to stay there the whole time. Uh, <laughs> Hashtag happy ending. <laughs> wow. The Quades still maintain an active social media presence. Randy's YouTube page, it's really something. They have hours long videos in which they state their many opinions on the state of the affairs of the world and were vociferous advocates for Donald Trump's presidential campaigns. Oh, yeah. Bye. Lost me. Randy's band, Randy and the Fugitives, released the song Star Whackers in 2011. The Quades made a documentary also called Star Whackers, and while it has been screened at least once in one single theater, no major distributors have picked up the film for any kind of release. Critics called it Drugged Out Dreck. Wow, dude! His <laughs> band name! And I am going to end this episode, or at least the, the, the written part, with the end of the Vanity Fair article, because for me, this is where the discussion actually should go. Okay. Yeah, and this is a, uh, from an article in January 2011 called The Quaid Conspiracy by Nancy Jo Sales uh, that was just outstanding. I mean, you know, the Vanity Fair, it is fairly biased, but it's funny as hell, and they actually do some pretty good reporting. So in the middle of the interview, Evie gets up and... This was right before she was going to go down for some sort of hearing in like uh, January 2011 uh, about some other shit that they did. Oh, it was for the, the squatting charge. Okay. So here's, here's something Evie says to the interviewer. Mm -hmm. He's been in this business for 40 years and I've been watching his back for 25. Why do you think he's still alive? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they kind of argue a bit about Randy going, hey, I, I think I should go down to this hearing. And she goes, no, you can't go down there. They're going to kill you. And he's like, no, I don't think I don't I don't think they do. And she goes, no, they're uh, Randy. You're crazy. They're crooks. So she leaves the room to head out and, or to walk the dog, which, oh, my God, the stories of the fucking dog. So she has this dog the whole time. At one point when they were arrested, they had all their shit packed into their Prius. Yeah. And <laughs> and. 
<laughs> and it, it just smelled like human filth and dog piss because she would let the dog piss wherever it wanted to. They were staying with a friend who was like, come on, you can stay here for a couple of weeks. And the dog just would literally piss wherever it wanted to. <laughs> a little while later, he was drinking a martini while Evie went out to walk the dog. I asked him where he thought all this was going. Well, he said, what I'd like to do and what I'm able to do, I'm not sure if they're two different things. What I'd like to do is put all this behind me and resolve it in some way that's favorable to us because I do believe we have many grievances against a lot of people. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. This is what I really want to say. My accountant, he sent me a letter behind Evie's back. He said, your wife is spending so much money. She's going to drag you into the poorhouse. They were trying to separate us, divide us, and it really affected me. Like I started looking at Evie sideways like, yeah, this bitch. Yeah, Evie was going into Hermes. She was going into all these stores, Chanel, the whole deal. But now I know if you total up the bills, they're just a little of the fraction of what I was capable of paying for. I was making enough money for me to comfortably support Evie and her shopping. They wanted to separate us because Evie is very intuitive and very smart. She's the smartest person I know. You can call her crazy. You can call her whatever you want, but she is my lifeline. And if she wasn't with me, I don't know where I'd be. Uh, well, hey, you know, fine. They both need the shrinks, but I guess they're in love, man. Yep. And that's the story of Lone Star Love. Wow. <laughs> I'm laying down now. Like I feel exhausted a little bit. Oh my God. Well, and I talked to several friends about this. I'm like, oh, I'm doing this one on Randy Quaid. They're like, oh, that crazy fucker. I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. So here, let's talk about why. why. So he was doing fine. Like he, he had had a marriage before this. They had, I think one or two kids and it ended in divorce. It it just didn't work out. Then he's in 1988. He sees this woman and Evie's like, fairly attractive honestly i mean she's she's a little bit older now and she's kept her looks yeah. and i think he was just smitten with her just absolutely smitten yeah. yeah and i think the feeling was mutual but i think she also saw kind of a way to get a little more famous and yeah. a little more yeah yeah and so you know things aren't going too well in the mid 2000s he gets this play and it's going to be his first broadway appearance and she just rolled with it, man. Yeah, she turned into just evil uh, stage spouse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, and, and and the thing is, like, it started with these little contract disputes. Like, hey, no, we we thought our contract said this one thing, and it's actually, you, you're not allowing us to do this. Then you have Heath Ledger and Chris Penn and David Carradine all die within a relatively short time uh, uh, around each other. And Randy Quaid knew all of them. And, you know, there's that great story about Jack Nicholson contacting Heath Ledger and saying, don't take this Joker part. Don't take the part. It's going to drive you crazy. Because he knew, he also knew Heath Ledger. And he's like, hey, I've played it. And I saw it taking me down some weird paths, man. I'm just giving you fair warning. But Heath took it. And there's those great stories of him like locking himself in hotel rooms, yeah. learning how to be the Joker. And then yeah. eight months later, he's dead of an overdose. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The psychology can't, you know, it can't be understated, I think. Right. Right. Well, like, yeah. yeah. And, and and while there are things in this that I go, yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> but, but a character playing a character elicits neurotransmitters and brain chemicals you know right 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 yeah i mean it is difficult and and i i love that uh, you know one thing that has happened in this whole pandemic is we're starting to reevaluate how we treat each other with intimacy on stage and i mentioned that on this program several times before you know you treat it like fight choreography i'm so i gotta say even though sometimes because i'm I'm such an opinionated, dirty old bitch. <laughs> throw every, I'll throw things out, but I'll tell you something. As a victim too, and I, I am really heartened to see the next generation and the next generation of theater makers who are really focusing on making safety a big thing. Mm-hmm. And I hope to see more of that. And I hope yeah those safety parameters continue to hold people softly and gently right and not become dogmatic Mm -hmm. so the the art 
and the personal chemistry of actors can help productions and help the story. Right. And and in, in this regard, you had all these people who were thinking they were going to go on and be in a Broadway show. They thought they were going there. Yeah. And, and this guy just ruined it. But it, it makes me wonder also if, I mean, they, they filed the charges after, after the whole thing. Yeah. Because, you know, they got screwed. They got really screwed. Oh. Oh. Um, and, and I get wanting to get some recompense out of that. But, you know, if we would have had the culture we have now at that time, it just makes me wonder if you would have had people who'd be like, uh, this guy's showing me his cod piece again, and that yeah. is not yeah. cool. Yeah. Do well, and that it would be nice if stories like this got more and more sparse. Yeah. <laughs> I, think the thing, I don't know. I think it's it's an interesting dichotomy because you have this and then you have parties that last until two or three mm-hmm. in the morning mm-hmm. where a bunch of people are all drunk, whatever. And in the late nineties, when we were all, you know, in our, our uh, ripped up jeans and flannel down mm-hmm. our asses off after shows and pawn each other and having fun, interesting sex uh-huh. stories on stage and off. It's a different world. It's a different yeah. world. And I think that learning boundaries, theater is learning boundaries. Yep. You know, despite the fact that I've been doing it for what, God, 35 years now. And I'll say you have done some very interesting works that that stretch like those levels of comfort uh, in a lot of different directions. I have tried and I've been very grateful for some of the really fun, interesting opportunities that, that I've gotten. I hope that we can all come together and through COVID, through Zoom and online, but also safe. Uh, personal ways. Right. This is the thing, you know, I always hear people telling us this is something if the theater's lasted since Dionysus, you know, yeah. and it's been dying since then. Right. And it's, oh, it's been dying, but, but you ask them <laughs> at any given time, they're like, Oh no, we're having this problem. And, and people are like COVID, whatever. In fact, I just got chills as I think, and I just think it is forcing people to think outside the box and yes. to find those ways in which we do connect and back again to my clan kind of scenario that how can we complement each other and push Mm -hmm. push each other forward both artistically boundary wise and just in telling the stories to humanity because that as theater makers is what we're here for yep Yep. oh my god i'm so emotional these days with this surgery i just almost i've got the clamps carry on here here. i'll I'll bring it back around just to kind of uh and things here. So we just realized at the beginning of, of recording this that you were in my first production in Seattle. And that was that was a play called The Memory of Water. And my character was the side guy of one of the main characters in the play. And within the first like five minutes of me being on stage, the the, the script has us making out in a bed. <laughs> yeah, wow. And I remember my first rehearsal this is my first show. I don't know anybody. Yeah. And, and, and Maggie was so sweet. My stage partner, Maggie, she was so sweet. And like our director, who I know you've had an interesting history with. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think that show was like a culmination of like, okay, yes. this, yes. this relationship is done. Um, and it's, 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 it's gone through many hills and yeah. valleys. Yeah. But the director just went, okay, let's see what we can do. Yeah. And I look at Maggie and, and, and she looks at me and I went, are, are, you know, I, I think we just had that awareness really uh-huh. early. Cause I was like, I, I think it was like 25, 26, something like that. And, and I look at her and, and I'm like, are we okay with this? And she's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. And I went, okay, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to touch anything. Is that all right? She's like, yes, yeah. please don't. And it, and it was just a moment that I, I had never experienced before. Yeah. And now it is almost, I mean, we're getting into this idea that this isn't just a craft, it's a job. Yeah. <laughs> and just like OSHA says, like, you know, you, you only can go up a certain yeah. number of steps on a ladder. This is definitely something that if 
anywhere in that scene where I'm making out with this person I've never really done anything with before, like no introductory readings or no anything. If I like put my hand on her hip or something like that, that could have triggered a response that I had no idea about. And I'm so glad that now we are able to take behavior like what Randy Quay did in Lone Star Love and put it on the table before it becomes a problem and go, this, we can't have this. Exactly. Awesome. Yay. Woo. God, what a story. Oh my God. I had no (laughs) idea. I feel so much more culturally enlightened now. (laughs) Well, I remember like... I think I read about it in the Times once. They're like, uh, this this production's being canceled. Director saying one thing, Randy Quaid saying another. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> and and then like three years later, he and his wife are just wreaking havoc up and down the West Coast. Dude, I wonder how many theater people actually do know that story. Like, especially yeah. around here. Or, or right. I wonder who I know that was like close to that or involved. It makes you, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that was a time when, like, we couldn't get work at the big houses. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a fringe town, and that was it. Yeah, you know, it the, was. yeah, the big houses just brought people in. So, oh, Christine, yeah. this was so awesome. Thank you for joining me for this today. I would love to have you on again sometime in the future, if that's cool for you, because oh, great repartee here. But for my friends and listeners, this has been another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. I'll be back to you in another two weeks with another fascinating story, and I will see you at intermission.